This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Africa requires $9 billion to buy and distribute 1.4 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines. UN Chief Guterres calls for COVID-19 vaccines to be availed to poor nations. And Kenyan doctors protest poor working conditions. Hello and welcome. You're watching Africa Live. We're coming to you live from Nairobi. I'm Hannah Vivier and here with the latest in business is Rama. Thank you very much, Hannah. Here's what's coming up in the course of the hour. Egypt's economy is recovering despite the economic damage inflicted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And U.S. regulators have sued Facebook, accusing it of stifling competition and trying to crush potential competitors early on. We'll have the details on those stories and lots more coming your way in the course of the hour. For now, let's start with the latest in current affairs with Hannah. Fascinating stories, Rama. We'll see you in a bit. Well, the World Health Organization says Africa will require at least $9 billion to procure and distribute 1.4 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines. The WHO's Immunization and Vaccines Development Program Coordinator, Dr. Richard Mihigo, says there is a need to ensure an adequate, an, equi an equitable and timely distribution of the vaccines. He shared this at the WHO Africa online press briefing on scaling up preparedness for COVID-19 vaccine rollout on the continent. Dr. Mihigo went on to say that there were currently no guarantees that there would be enough supplies before the end of 2021. He further explained that it was not just about the cost of the vaccines, but rather the cost of delivering them. The Africa Centers for Disease Control says it is currently unable to predict when any COVID-19 vaccines will arrive for use on the continent. It's appealing to the UN to convene a special session to discuss the need for equitable distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. There is concern that developed countries are amassing excess vaccines for themselves, leaving regions like Africa struggling. The UK has already begun a mass vaccination using the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Kaleto and Johi reports. A report from the People's Vaccine Alliance says rich countries have hoarded enough doses to vaccinate their entire populations nearly three times over. But the Coalition of Health and Humanitarian Organizations says 67 poor countries will only be left with enough to vaccinate one in ten people. Africa is worried it won't be able to acquire the over one billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines it needs to immunize at least 60 percent of its population. It is my appeal to the United Nations to really summon a special session to discuss vaccine timely and ethical and fair allocation so that the world does not look confused and so that the world does not uh, get into a, a mode where we begin to create this uh, north-south uh, distrust with respect to access to, to vaccines, which is supposed to be a common good. We know that COVID will not be defeated in the West alone, that COVID will be defeated all over the world. So far, three vaccines have proven to have highest efficacy, the Pfizer, Moderna and AstraZeneca jabs. The Africa CDC says it is working with member states to prepare for the storage and distribution of any vaccines approved by the World Health Organization. Say, for example, if uh, Moderna says they are ready to supply us uh, 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 a country X with vaccines, and as I stated earlier, uh, we shouldn't just say, well, you, you need a minus 25 degrees Celsius. We should say, well, if we get a Moderna vaccine, we can start vaccinating at, in your capital cities and you put uh, 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 minus 80 or minus 20 uh, deep uh, freezers at multiple sites and start vaccinating. And uh, that would allow us time to start vaccinating while waiting for the, the newer uh, 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 versions of the vaccines to, uh, to, to arrive. The pipeline for vaccines looks very encouraging. I mean, COVID vaccine looks very, very encouraging. The continent is also following up closely on China's Sinovac vaccine. We are in discussions with the, the, the government of China. China is also talking to individual countries. We all encourage that such dialogue should go through the Africa CDC and the African Union. We encourage that countries should also 
defer such discussions to uh, the Africa CDC and the AU for coordination. The AU and the Africa CDC is a member state instrument created by member states, so they should really be using these instruments to, to engage with their, their companies so that we truly have the whole of Africa approach uh, for these vaccines. The Africa CDC expects that vaccines will arrive in the continent next year, but says it can't say when. During 2021, that will happen. African countries are assured that vaccines for 20% of their populations will be acquired through a joint global WHO-led initiative called COVAX. The initiative says it has managed to secure 700 million doses of the vaccines that will be distributed among 92 low-income countries that have signed up. The African Union will hold a high-level meeting in January 2021 to discuss further the financing and acquisition of the millions more vaccine doses it will need. Kuleton Johi, CGTN, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Meanwhile, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres is calling for coronavirus vaccines to be availed to poor nations, especially those in Africa. According to him, the rollout of the vaccines should be good news to the world. It has hardly been a month since the announcement of major breakthroughs in the search of COVID-19 vaccines from the United States, Britain, and even Russia. The news of the efficacy of their respective vaccines have been encouraging. But amid this excitement, rich nations have been stockpiling the vaccines for their citizens, leaving the poor nations to watch from a distance. UN Secretary General now says leaving out these poor countries could be a weak link in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. But I reiterate my call for a COVID-19 vaccine to be a global public good available to everyone, everywhere, and particularly available in Africa. Most African countries lack the financing to adequately respond to the crisis, due in part to declining demand and prices of their commodity exports. Addressing the press at the United Nations headquarters in New York City, Guterres said the vaccines are good news, not just for the respective nations and pharmaceutical firms, but also for the entire world. He also called for those with access to the vaccines to be inoculated. I encourage everybody that uh, um, has access to the vaccine to be vaccinated because it is a service not only that we provide to ourselves, each one of us being vaccinated provides a service to the whole community because we are no longer spreading. There is no risk of spreading the disease. So vaccination is, for me, a moral obligation in relation to all of us. The World Health Organization launched the COVAX initiative in April. It was meant to allow nations access COVID-19 treatment tools. The only way to guarantee to uh, the African continent uh, the vaccines that uh, the African continent needs, and we all need, because uh, if Africa is not properly supported, we will not be able to fight the pandemic anywhere effectively. The only way is, of course, to make sure that the COVAX initiative that has gathered a large number of countries, but all the specialized institutions from the uh, World Health Organization to Gavi to um, uh, CEPI and to, to all the others, to make sure that the, the COVAX is financed. Poor health and infrastructural systems have been cited as some of the few issues that could make it hard to store and distribute the drugs effectively on the African continent. And Oxycoli, CGTN. American health experts are holding talks on whether the U.S. Food and Drug Administration should approve Pfizer's coronavirus vaccine for emergency use. The group of experts is expected to vote on whether the vaccine has shown effectiveness in preventing COVID-19 and if the benefits of taking the shot outweigh the risks. After the vote, the FDA is expected to make a decision on authorizing the vaccine ahead of the meeting. The FDA had said that it was reviewing all the data, including potential allergic reactions in the wake of the UK's warning. With the UK already administering a COVID-19 vaccine to its citizens and other Western countries expected to start their programs soon, there are fears that some African countries will be left behind. We spoke to some people regarding this, and this is what they had to say. I don't think this is fair. The vaccine has become more of a commercial race rather than protecting public health. Countries that can pay will get it first. I guess it's normal during any crisis. 
I hope though that Africa can cooperate with the WHO to make other vaccines available soon. We can't say that it's not fair. It's about excelling. Every nation has worked on its own vaccine. It's logical that they suffice their need first. After that, they can think about exporting. Even if Egypt was the first nation to have the vaccine, before sending it to Europe, it will get distributed here first. It's a global market after all. A producer can dictate who gets what. People in Kenya held a vigil for doctors who had died of COVID-19, including 28-year-old Dr. Stephen Muguso. The doctors who complained of poor working conditions urged the government to ensure that they were provided with adequate personal protective equipment. CDTN's Wilka Senyawa reports. As the rest of the world sped past, young Kenyan doctors halted other afternoon activities to assemble outside the Ministry of Health headquarters. Many war tags or carried placards written I am Mogusu in honor of their colleague. 28-year-old Dr. Stephen Mogusu died of COVID-19 complications on Monday. The Kenyan Medical Practitioners and Dentists Union says at the time of his death, Mogusu had gone five months without receiving his salary. And though he worked in a COVID isolation facility, he also reportedly didn't have health insurance. He was uh, a student leader of ours. He was ever so courageous, larger than life. So standing here, we say I am shaken to see Mogusu has been taken by the COVID-19 virus. Mogusu's death, health workers say, serves to highlight their plight as they stand on the front line in a pandemic. They complain of lack of essential protective gear and poor working conditions. We would want the government to step in and actually ensure all doctors around the country have adequate PPEs, are given comprehensive health insurance such that when they're ill, they're able to, get to, to, to seek and get care without fearing about their costs. On Monday, Health workers, including nurses across the country, launched an industrial action. Doctors who were scheduled to join them called off their strike at the last minute. Instead, they gave the government 14 days to meet their demands. We keep on seeing our doctors, our consultants dying in the front line. And this is not right. The government has a responsibility to protect its own by providing enough PPEs from, to the students in school rotating in the wards in Kenyatta to the ones in the front line. But they are being neglected. The young doctor's death comes at a time when other health workers in the country have also given notice, vowing to down their tools as they ask the government to remunerate and equip them better to help them to tackle the pandemic. On Tuesday, the Chief Administrative Secretary for Health, Masi Mongangi, acknowledged the death of the 28-year-old doctor and called it regrettable. She added that the government was in discussions to ensure that Mogusu's family got the aid they required while ensuring that this wasn't a situation that would recur among other healthcare workers. At least 13 Kenyan doctors have died of COVID-19 complications since Kenya reported its first case in March. As the medical fraternity in this country, my lord. At the vigil, doctors shared stories about Mogusu, said a prayer, lit candles and then they dispersed, headed back to work. They were still needed to battle a pandemic. Wilkisanya was CGTN. Ghana's incumbent president and now Kufo Ado has won re-election in a tightly contested presidential race. He came up against former president John Mahama and 10 other candidates. Electoral Commission's results put Nana Kufo Ado in the lead with nearly 52% of the total votes cast. CGTN's Nabil Ahmed Rafai reports from Accra. Catherine Finney turned 18 this year. She voted for the first time in Ghana's elections. The presidential race was a close one between incumbent Nana Ekufuado and former President John Mahama, both seeking to improve the lives of Ghanaians and the economy. I suffered in paying my school fees, but my younger siblings didn't. They had the opportunity to go to free SHS, and that has really helped my family a lot. So that's why I decided to vote for him. His Excellency Nana Akufuado. The Electoral Commission says nearly 80% of the electorate turned up to vote, an improvement on the nearly 70% turnout recorded in 2016. One, two, 
The counting of ballots went deep into the night, with voters keenly watching the process at every step. Two days after the polls, the long wait for results ended with this announcement by the Electoral Commission. By the power vested in me as the chairperson of the Electoral Commission of Ghana and the returning officer of the presidential election, it is my duty and honor to declare Nana Adedankwa Akufuado as president-elect of the Republic of Ghana. The Electoral Commission said Nana Akufuado won with almost 52% of the votes cast, while his political rival John Mahama had 47.36%. I give you my word that I will continue to work very hard to build a prosperous and progressive Ghana for which we yearn. The decisive margin of victory in this election constitutes for me an endorsement of the policies and programs initiated by my government and put before the electorate. And I'm determined to do all in my power to accomplish the task of this new mandate. Nana Ekufuado from now has an uphill task to turn around the country's economy, which has been badly hit by the coronavirus pandemic, coupled with fighting corruption that plagued his previous government. The celebration of President-elect Nana Ekufuado's win saw supporters gather here at his residence. The president has urged them to celebrate in moderation and maintain peace with the opposition party. Nana Ekufuado will be sworn into office on January 7 to continue his second term. While observers have said Ghana's election has largely been peaceful, the death of five people through electoral violence was a blot on the democratic process. For people like Catherine, who voted for Nana Ekufuado, they want more jobs to be created in the next four years to reduce the unemployment rate in the country. Nabil Ahmed Rufai, CGTN, Accra, Ghana. Time now for us to take a short break. Let's take a look at what's coming up. EU publishes contingency plan in case of a no-deal Brexit. And Egypt reports poverty rate drop for the first time in 20 years. Africa is a continent of diversity, with varied climates and enchanting geography, and a people so distinct but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Adnan Shirishi, Tunis, Cairo, Syria, Juba, Johannesburg, Ethiopia, Tanzania. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back. You're watching news making headlines right here on Africa Live. The European Union has laid out a backup plan to avoid disruptions to travel and fishing access in case of a no-deal Brexit. The UK, which formally left the EU in January, has been in a transition period that's set to expire on December the 31st. Negotiators from both sides have been in a deadlock trying to figure out a post-Brexit trade deal. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson and European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen failed to reach an agreement on Wednesday. They agreed, though, to extend talks until Sunday. Border checks and taxes could be introduced if both sides are unable to reach and ratify a deal by the end of the month. Well, CGTN's Tony Waterman joins us for more from Brussels. Tony, thank you so much for joining us. The EU has published a contingency plan in case of a no-deal Brexit. What more can you tell us about this, Tony? Well, these contingency plans are very narrow in scope and mostly focus on air and road transport. The commission is proposing that there be a six-month grace period to ensure that people and goods can continue to flow across borders if there is no deal by December 31st. This could prevent what could be just mass chaos and gridlock at these borders if the withdrawal period or the uh, transition period rather ends with no deal. They're also proposing that there be reciprocal access to EU and UK fishing Waters for up to a year. Now, the UK, for this to work, is going to have to agree to those terms and then also agree to the fine print, which includes the UK maintaining 
EU uh, access, EU rules on standards at, at, during this period. And this could be a very tough pill for the UK to swallow, who's very anxious to return to their sovereignty. And while the UK said today that they were going to look over these mini deals, uh, that they were downplaying really the severity of those potential disruptions. But uh, member states and governments here in Europe have been begging the Commission for these contingency, contingency plans for weeks now because, as you mentioned, these talks have been at a virtual stalemate. That dinner last night between Ursula von der Leyen and Boris Johnson yielded no sort of breakthrough, ending with both of them saying that they just remained very far apart. Uh, Michel Barnier, the EU's chief negotiator, tweeting not long ago that he's back around the negotiating table with his UK counterpart to true the stalemate. And they have now a Sunday deadline. This is when they're going to have uh, a decision on what happens next in these talks. Are we going to continue these talks or are we going to declare that there's a no a deal scenario? But these contingency plans coming out partly because of the no deal, but also if they manage to eke out a deal in the coming weeks, there's concern that there just will not be enough time to ratify it and have it in place for January first. Setonia, so, two-day EU leaders summit also began today in Brussels. What was on the agenda of that summit and what do you expect to come out of those meetings? Well, Brussels has gone to great lengths to try to uh, paint this EU leader summit, which has been on the calendar for weeks now, as one which would deal with European issues, domestic issues, and not Brexit. But it is now being overshadowed by Brexit. And in fact, uh, until a couple of hours ago, the Brexit wasn't even on the formal agenda. It's now going to be the main topic of discussion over a working dinner that's taking place in just a couple hours' time. And at that point, Ursula von der Leyen is going to brief the EU leaders on where where the negotiations stand and also uh, the outcome of talks last night, probably giving them a bit more detail than we've heard in the news today. The other non-Brexit related issues, there are many of them and they are very heavy issues that these leaders have to look at, but the most pressing is going to be the long-term budget and the coronavirus recovery fund, this $2.2 trillion spending package, which was agreed to back in July, but has since been uh, threatened to be torpedoed by Hungary and Poland. They're not very happy that now this money is, for the first time, is going to be linked to the rule of law. So any country that is seen backsliding on democracy stands to lose out on EU funding. And both Warsaw and Budapest right now are being investigated for just that, for undermining the independence of the courts and the media. So they are on the hook potentially to be losing out on uh, tens of billions of dollars in EU funding. Germany, which holds the rotating presidency right now, has brokered a deal and it seems as if uh, they're going to have the final sign off today. It would just delay the implementation of the uh, rule of law. Climate also on the agenda. We're expecting that the EU leaders are going to agree to increase their reduction target for greenhouse gas emissions for 2030, upping it from 40 percent to 55 percent. Also, EU U.S. relations are something that are going to be discussed. There's a lot of optimism here that there's going to be a reset in the transatlantic relationship with the Biden administration coming into the White House on January 20th. So there's a lot of for them to discuss. But again, overshadowing quite a bit now because of Brexit. We're just three weeks away now from the end of that transition period. Thank you so much for that. Tony Waterman joining us live from Brussels. Well, the number of refugees across the globe has reached 80 million, even as COVID-19 continues to affect the UNHCR's resettlement programs. Many of the refugees are from Africa. And as CGTN's Enoch Sokolia reports, UNHCR believes the only way to reverse the trend is to stop the ongoing wars. Statistics from the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, show an increase in the number of people forced out of their homes. There are now 80 million refugees worldwide. According to UNHCR's Media Trends report on forced displacement, the figure includes 45.7 million internally displaced people, 29.6 million refugees and others forcibly displaced outside their country and 4.2 million asylum seekers. The report cites persecution, conflict and human rights violations as the main factors forcing people to flee. Violence in Syria, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Mozambique, Somalia and Yemen drove new displacements in the first half of 2020. The agency says the situation now requires global attention. 
UN High Commissioner for Refugees Filippo Grandi says, and I quote, we are now surpassing another bleak milestone that will continue to grow unless world leaders stop wars. The Sahel region, which is battling a brutal militant insurgency, has also seen fresh displacements. The report further says that the COVID-19 pandemic has greatly affected plans to resettle refugees around the globe. In order to contain the virus during the first wave, 168 countries and regions fully or partially closed their borders with 90 countries and regions, making no exception for people seeking asylum. This led to a significant decrease in the number of refugees resettled. Only 17,400 refugees were given new places to call home. The number has reduced to a half of those who were resettled last year. Enoxicolia, CGTN. Egypt's official statistics agency has reported that the poverty rate in the country has dropped for the first time in 20 years. It went down from 32.5% in the 2017-2018 fiscal year to 29.7% in 2019-2020. Many cities like Cairo and Alexandria have witnessed better results in rural areas and upper Egypt. Household income also increased by 15%. Yes, Sarah Kim looks at how this has been achieved and the challenge is still ahead. A belated but positive news for the predominantly poor population. A corruption-packed former regime followed by two uprisings, instability and the war on terrorism have delayed efforts for fighting poverty. Experts relate the drop in poverty rates to the latest economic reforms. It's as a result of the social protection programs by the government during the reforms of the last five years. These programs reduce poverty in the country. Also, upgrading the educational system, upgrading social services and raising the minimum wage. It was very important. Nuha Farouk, a street vendor and mom of three, is one of many who have benefited from these social services. As part of the state's health campaign, my family was checked for any ailments. Now I am being treated for an illness and doctors are following up on me continuously and medicine is provided at no cost at all. Raising salaries, pensions and monthly financial aid to the extremely poor, in addition to a drop in prices of food and basic goods, this has helped many Egyptians face economic difficulties. However, the CAPMAS report cited that rural areas and Upper Egypt have not fared as well as the main cities. Increasing social protection programs and ensuring that they are fairly distributed to cover the villages and rural areas around the country is the big challenge. We have to guarantee that the poor everywhere have access to these programs. This is how poverty can decline at higher rates. The government has vowed to continue its efforts by improving health and education systems, creating more jobs and doubling the budget for social welfare programs. Yasser Hakim for CGTN, Cairo. Well, I'll be standing by for more news, including the latest from sport. But now let's take a look at what's happening in business with Rama. Thank you very much, Hannah. Here's what's coming up in business. Egypt's economy is recovering despite the economic damage inflicted by the pandemic. And the Federal Trade Commission is suing Facebook, accusing it of trying to stifle competition. We'll have the details next. It's just taken me completely out of my depth, but at the same time it's exciting. It's new, it's different, it's a challenge. It's really exciting.
Let's start up north in Egypt. The country's finance minister says that the country is recording positive growth rates. Mohamed Maid described the turnaround as a positive achievement given the economic damage inflicted on the country by the COVID-19 pandemic. According to the minister, the forecast GDP growth rate for the 2021-2022 fiscal year is anywhere between 2.8 to 4 percent. Here's UTN's Yasser Hakim with the details. For Egypt becoming one of the few countries that have posted positive economic growth rates in 2020 has not been an easy feat. It's a culmination of five years of aggressive economic reforms and austerity measures. It's also the outcome of a successful emergency plan to deal with the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. It assisted in boosting the resilience of the Egyptian economy and uh, led to further diversify the economy and this helped greatly in uh, facing the challenges of the external shocks that resulted from the COVID-19 crisis and the fiscal stimulus package that is imposed by the Egyptian government led to a great success also in helping the household, the most hardly hit sectors and this is one of the most important things that helped the economy to be more resilient in curbing the inflation and the, the inflationary impacts that resulted from the COVID-19 crisis. Now the government hopes to build on that strong showing in 2021. International institutions say that Egypt has succeeded in weathering the storm and managed to be one of the 15% of the countries and the second highest worldwide in economic growth rates. But any further progress depends on whether travel is going to increase, will tourism recover, will all hotels and shops remain open, it's unclear. Cairo had targeted a 6% economic growth in 2021, but the coronavirus has knocked that back to a predicted 3 or 4%. So there is a lot of work ahead to make up for the expected slowdown. We are building uh, the export pace and extending the export pace, and we are increasing the industrial base and boosting the local in manufacturing greatly. And also that we have Egypt external position um, is outstanding and we are attracting more and foreign and direct, uh, indirect investment and also increasing the revenues from the experts and the remittance. 2021 poses another challenge to the government, how to deal with the budget deficit, debts and financial burden of supporting the economy against the effects of the pandemic. Yes, Hakim for CGTN, Cairo. As the holiday season begins, South Africa has resumed long-distance train services between major urban centres after suspending them for nine months. CGTN's Angela Coppola explores how this resumption will adapt to the pandemic. The service, known as Shoshaloza Mail, runs between Johannesburg, Cape Town, Durban, Port Elizabeth and East London. It was officially reopened recently as the peak Christmas season begins. I don't think there's a problem um, with it as long as they keep to the um, social distancing and, and that might be an issue. Uh, the, those trains got three different classes and uh, um, the, the CETA class, which is the um, least expensive one, uh, can take up between 80 and 85 people per coach. And uh, so social distancing might be a, a problem. One of the concerns initially was railway safety and security. There have been reports of communities invading railway stations and vandalizing the trains and rail tracks. Yeah, because the trains are operated on transnet lines and um, the transnet trains has never stopped running. Um, they never stopped these security contracts like Prasa did so that they don't have on the open lines the same security or safety issues that Prasa have. And the frequency of trains is also much less. There will be many people who will make use of the service, especially during the holidays, and stay off the country's roads during the festive season. You can also, if you want to go on holiday, even put your vehicle on the train. They've got these um, uh, coaches that can carry cars. Um, so when you get to Durban or Port Elizabeth or Cape Town, you can um, go on holiday in your own car. But I think, personally, I, I would believe it's a safer option uh, if you can travel first class or... Um, or the, the, the premier class. Station security and overcrowding is a concern, however, especially as the country enters the traditional festive season. Because Price is running really on skeleton staff in Bloemfontein or, or some of the other smaller um, stations, they don't have enough security personnel to control the crowds. And 
that is a concern. It's maybe my only concern with this initiative is the, um, the fact that overcrowding of trains will take place. Long distance travellers now have another option to use that train service between the major cities on the way down to the coast. But they need to be practicing social distancing. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. In the United States, federal regulators and over 45 state attorneys general have sued Facebook. Now, that lawsuit essentially accuses the social network of taking illegal actions by buying up rivals in order to stifle or prevent competition. The Federal Trade Commission in particular is seeking a permanent injunction that could, among other things, require Facebook to divest its assets. And that would include Instagram, for which it paid a billion dollars, and WhatsApp, for which it paid $19 billion around six years ago, effectively breaking up Facebook. With the filing of these twin lawsuits, Facebook becomes the second big tech company to face major legal challenges this year. The U.S. Justice Department sued Alphabet's Google back in October and accused a $1 trillion company of using its market power in order to fend off rivals. More than 20 months after it was grounded following two deadly crashes, one in Indonesia and one in Ethiopia, Boeing's 737 MAX returned to the skies on Wednesday with an incident-free commercial flight in Brazil. The low-cost carrier Gold's Flight 4104 from Sao Paulo arrived safely in the southern city of Porto Alegre about 70 minutes after takeoff using the revamped jet. Boeing hopes that the flight will turn the page on a badly damaging crisis in the wake of these twin crashes. Most of the travelers aboard the plane, which was 88% occupied, uh, and it has a capacity of about 186 passengers total, most of the passengers took little notice of the model number painted on the plane's nose. Gold's crew, for their part, made no mention of the fact that it was the first commercial flight for the 737 MAX since its global grounding in March 2019. The flight was normal, as if with any other aircraft, Accidents do happen, but if she was corrected and flew a perfect flight, I have nothing to complain about. It was my first time flying. I felt a chill in my stomach, but it was cool, very normal, thank God. Onto the Middle East now, Israeli tech firms have descended on Dubai to take part in the region's largest tech trade show as diplomatic ties between Israel and the United Arab Emirates continue to improve. Here's CGTN's Jim Stenman for this report. Distributed clouds, enhanced connectivity, artificial intelligence. These are just some of the hottest trends on display at JITEX, the Middle East's largest tech trade show, this year attracting some 1,200 exhibitors from 60-plus countries in the middle of a global pandemic. Now, this week-long event, now in its 40th edition, has never put on a show quite like this before. Not only is it billed one of the tech world's first major in-person events during COVID-19, it also has an entire day dedicated to UAE-Israel collaboration, something that just a few months ago would have been unthinkable. Israeli think the world is from gold here. The recent normalization agreement between the two nations is good for business. So say members of Israel's tech scene, many of whom are in Dubai for the very first time. The smartness and all this innovation thinking of Dubai, it's, it's kind of uh, open us, all of the Israeli companies, startup companies, uh, to explore new opportunities, new markets. With uh, one of the Scooters company, Israeli company invested here, we will be open to invest here also. And that could be music to the ears of the UAE as the oil-rich state looks to diversify its economy. Israel, known for its thriving startup scene, has built an impressive tech ecosystem that could serve as a blueprint for the Emirates' own future. And clearly from the numbers, uh, whether it's the uh, amount of investment or the output as technologies around the world, you know that Israel has done it in the right way. While drawing on those lessons would have been nearly impossible in the past, the two countries now enjoy direct flights and visa-free travel. Logistics giant DP World estimates initial bilateral trade could be in the region of 5 billion US dollars. The UAE also has significant sovereign wealth funds that could invest into Israeli tech, which has relied heavily on foreign direct investment from China and the US. They might, yes. I'd be happier to see, uh, to see companies operating here. 
Both Israel and the UAE are betting big on smart technology, which could transform the very future of our cities, especially in areas such as mobility. Dubai has an ambitious target of 25% of driverless vehicles by 2030, perhaps making the Emirates an ideal place for piloting Israeli projects. Both governments declare that they are like taking the risk of taking the holistic approach of supportive regulation, of uh, taking the risk financially. And again, those two, those two things go hand in hand with promoting uh, joint uh, projects and collaboration. And learning from Israel could be a good opportunity for the UAE as it moves towards building a knowledge-based economy and becoming an innovation hub, a trend that's only likely to accelerate given historic low oil demand during the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. It wants to be a center for tech innovation, tech investment and tech startups. So whether it's smart cities, cybersecurity, fintech, health tech, agricultural technology, all of those areas are important to the UAE and to Israel uh, to sell externally around the world, but also to develop the economies locally. While it's difficult to predict what the future might hold, there are certainly the building blocks for a partnership that could help usher in a brighter future for both countries and perhaps the region at large. Jim Stenman, CGTN, Dubai. And I'll leave it there for the time being. I'll be back at the top of the hour. In global business, we'll be looking at Brexit yet again. Trade deal talks are still continuing, even though the UK is supposed to leave the EU in another 21 days. Can we actually have a deal by Sunday? We'll find out live from Brussels at the top of the hour. See you then. For now, back to Hannah. Thank you for that, Rama. Let's take a look at what's coming up after the break. In our continuing series of Made in Africa, we explore how East Africa attracts tourists with Tinga Tinga paintings. My family has been doing this artwork for the past 600 years. is to be the reading player in, in, in Africa, in the spice sector. Nobody in the region consumes it. Even me cannot afford the vanilla cooking. Here is the elegance, the color, the celebration of life. Tinga Tinga paintings are made through a unique and visually remarkable painting style that was developed in the second half of the 20th century in Tanzania, East Africa. Now Tinga Tinga is one of the most widely represented forms of tourist oriented paintings in Tanzania, Kenya and other neighboring countries. Today we tour Tinga Tinga village in Dar es Salaam and meet Abdul Mukura, one of the best painters within the Tinga Tinga team. Jina langu Abdu Amonde Mkura. Nimekuja hapa mwaka 1974 na nilipokuja hapa hamna nilifikia kwa ndugu kwa kaka yangu ni Omar Amonde. Kaka yangu nilimkuta anachora picha za tinga tinga. Lakini sikufahamu tinga tinga ni nini lakini alinielimisha tu vizuri tu. Tinga tinga maana yake kwamba ni mtu mmoja alianzisha anaitwa Edward Said tinga tinga. Ye ya meanza kazi ya kuchora uh, mojo fumia tisa sitini na nane. Ilipo fika sabina mbili ya kapariki. Sisi hapa ni mshirika. Tinga Tinga Society 
cooperative tumeanzisha na tisini mpaka leo tunakubalika na serikali na katika memba watinga tinga tuko hamsini na mbili tinga tinga ilikuja kwamba ni kitu cha kufikiri kichwani zamani ilikuwa tunakata sindibodi kwa hiyo tunakata zile tu kwa kutegemea size ambayo inatakikana kubebeka baadaye tena mfumo wa kuchukua wateja wetu wanaviona mzito ndio tukabadilisha mfumo wa plaudi ili kwa vile mzito kwa kubeba ndio tukachukua sasa kuwa watu na wamba kwenye frame nguo ambaye material yetu sasa tumebadilisha ndio haya mnayaona madukani sasa hivi Usanii wa zamani unatofautiana na sasa hivi Zamani tinga tinga hamna kusketch Tinga tinga inakuja kwamba unachukua unatayarisha rangi wewe na brush na ni unaanza kuchora lakini unaanza kuchora sio kwa kutazama kwamba ku coping mahali kwa mfano kama mimi nimeishi kijijini wanyama wale tulikuwa tu wengine tunakutana nao huyu swala huyu pundamilia huyu eh, eh, faru utachora kama vile ulivyomuona hatuwezi kufananisha na kitu ila tunachukua mawazo ya kichwani kwa hiyo mfumo huu umebadilika mara mbili au mara tatu kwa sababu mpaka sasa hivi kwenye tray tunaweza kuchora kwenye sinia ambaye yeye aluminium tunaweza kuchora kwenye t-shirt tunaweza kuchora kwa hiyo ili mabadiliko haya yamekwenda msisimko wa kazi ambaye tunazo dhibuni sisi wenyewe Mimi ninapenda kuchora picha michoro mingi sana. Lakini michoro nilio kupendelea sana na hasa kuwa na moyo wangu kupenda sana michoro wa tembo. Tembo nimechora miaka 20 zilizopita. Nilikuwa na mawazo ya kufikiria hali ya tembo alivyo. Kwanza tembo ni mkubwa kuliko wanyama wote. Alafu tembo ana nguvu kuliko wanyama wote. Niliwaza kwamba nikiweka tembo niweke mpako mweusi. Lakini eh, kwa nini ninaweka mpako mweusi? Huu mpako mweusi sawa na gi, giza wakati hamna mbala mwezi, hamna nyota kali. Giza nene. Sasa na huyu hii nyeusi ni tembo. Yeye ni anatembea usiku. Kwa hiyo sasa Nilifananisha kwamba wale wakubwa hawaoni usiku hawaoni mchana sasa sawa na inti anaikanyaga tu bwana wewe twende Hizi kazi tuna sisi tunabadilisha kila awamu sasa vijana wa sasa hivi kwanza wameenda shule wanataka kwenda na maisha ya sasa hivi digital sasa lazima wachanganye zamani mpaka sasa hivi na ndio maana tunaona picha zimebadilika Tinga tinga imesifika kwa maadili ya uchoraji wenyewe umekuwa kama katuni na elimisha kama shule. Wengi wametengeneza vitabu. Wengi wamefundishia watoto. Kwa hiyo ni moja la somo tinga tinga. Inaelimisha. Mpango wangu wa kwenda mbele kwamba picha mimi huwa natumia baada ya miaka mitatu ninafikiri kuchora kitu kingine kipya na muundo niliyechora hivi sasa hivi ninatarajia kuchora picha ingine mpya inaitwa jina la hiyo picha inaitwa zamani mpaka siku hizi na matarajio yangu hiyo picha itakuwa zaidi ya picha zingine zote zile nilizoanza kuzichora kwa wakati Let's have that first take a show break and return. Here's what's coming up in the world of sport. We talked to Zimbabwe cricket chairman Tevenga Mukulani as he targets good fortunes for his team in 2021.
how would you create your legend? On the field, on the tracks, in the arenas of Africa. Were you born?